Right. All They're of not them. teaching the same thing. And, but I would also say, even if they were, fundamentally, religions at their foundations are not about ethics. <laughs> Welcome to our channel, where we make it our ambition to respect and learn from our neighbors, to equip the church, and share the message of Jesus until all here. The elephant in the room, religious differences. Today we're going to be discussing something that I'm sure if you've had any conversation with people who don't even strictly follow a religion or people from different, different faith backgrounds, there's always an emphasis on the similarities within religions and what they teach. And there is a, I think, a, a misguided effort in promoting healthy dialogue between the faiths. I mean, there's, you see the, here in Canada, we have the coexist campaign sure, which yeah. i think is global if i'm yeah if yeah. i'm not uh, wrong about that uh, it's this sort of idea that all faiths can coexist and that underlying this also talks about reverting back to our first video is it arrogant to know the truth is that religions don't really deal with objective truth claims they're just moral practices mm -hmm. that are good for you and that right. all religions hold a value of ethical teaching and that some even go so far as to claim that the ethical teaching is all the same that they all mm -hmm. teach the same things right so do they all teach the same things I come out of occultic spirituality and the new age mm -hmm. and I spent a lot of time in my younger years caring about what is true and wanting to know what is true so I fell into a a, um, a school of thought called perennialism where I believe that all religions at their core, at their sort of secret knowledge, the, the mm -hmm. sort of esoteric knowledge of the religions, they were all trying to teach the mm -hmm. same thing, and that ultimately is that you are all God, everything is God. I really didn't examine or critique my beliefs at this time. This is just what fit with my personal experience. So I think that that's a good way to, for us to, mm. to get into the something that you brought up earlier, Greg, when we were talking before recording this about the golden rule. Give a little introduction to the golden rule, and then we're gonna look at some examples across different faiths that all, which appear on a surface mm -hmm. level to teach the same thing. You know, I'm sure many of those who are watching this video have seen the golden rule posters. I've seen them in classrooms and even in seminary. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah. Um, so I'll just read some examples. Basically, the idea is that there's like this core uh, ethical teaching that's supposed to summarize the the essence of the teachings of a religion. And you can find a version of this statement in different wording, but the same idea across the board in all different religions. So uh, Jesus says in Matthew 7, verse 12, So whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them. For this is the law and the prophets. In Islam, in the Hadith, which is a collections of sayings of Muhammad, um, in An Nawawi's 40 Hadith, Hadith number 13, it says, None of you uh, truly believes, and none of you Muslims truly believes until he wishes for his brother what he wishes for himself. Rabbinic Judaism in the Talmud, um, Rabbi Hillel said, what is hateful to you, do not do to your fellow. This is the whole Torah. The rest is the explanation. Go and learn. Buddhism um, in uh, Udana Varga, it says, hurt not others in ways that you yourself would find hurtful. Or another one, and this is the abbreviated form of it, in, for Jainism, there's a saying that says, a man should wander Oh, man should wander about treading all tre creatures as he himself would be treated. Uh, in other words, he's going to go about, he's going to wander around and treat, thinking about how he's treating the tre creatures around him, right? And so this, even in Jainism, means careful where you step. So in these examples, and more can be multiplied, what do you think, Daniel? Are they teaching the same thing? Yeah, so let's let's look back at them again. 
one by one and we'll show that on the surface it appears the same but underlying them there is a lot of differences mm -hmm. so i would say um rabbi hillel's and and the teaching that jesus made is more on par with mm -hmm. each other mm -hmm. this is a backdrop of uh, the old testament law of the ten commandments well and they actually they they were potentially even contemporaries with hillel being uh, supposedly dying around 10 a.d Oh wow! So okay, so they were Jesus the would time. have been young, not in his ministry yet, but right. Yeah, this is the Muslim one. None yeah. of you truly believes until he wishes for his brother what he wishes for himself. So right. his brother being a Muslim, right? A fellow believer, and this is not to say that you know Muslims do not they that they don't want to treat others as they themselves want to be treated. But mm -hmm. using this passage to say that it's teaching the same thing as what we read in the Bible or what Rabbi Hillel was saying, mm -hmm. um, we can see because it's not. The context is within fellow believing Muslims. Right. There's the Jane statement too. A man should wander about treating all creatures as he himself would be treated. Is that the same thing? Yeah, um, definitely not. I mean, this is uh, in, in Christianity and in in Judaism as well we have this mm -hmm. understanding of man uh, being made in the image of God that's his character and likeness mm -hmm. and that there is a certain level of uh, innate goodness to that and that plants and, and and microbiomes and is not made in the image of God uh, so this is not this is clearly not saying the same thing yeah and I don't want to pretend like we're able to um, provide the best representation of these right. statements. Uh, right. Some of these I've studied more in context and some I haven't as much. So like Jainism, I don't know as much about, but I know that they're, they are known for more radical or extreme kind of forms of like vegetarianism and stuff right. like that. Like they won't, uh, they're very careful even like treating every single living being as basically equal. And on that level, Jains, including all living beings whatsoever, uh, whereas then in Islam, the Hadith is emphasizing brothers. Right. Um, whereas rabbinic Judaism, like Hillel and Jesus are not talking about whether it's a fellow Jew or Christian. Right. Um, which isn't to say that in those other religions, there isn't something that might be equivalent in how we're supposed to treat other people, even if they're right. from a different religious background. Right. It's not to try to um, ridicule or... Um, yeah, po to critique these sayings, but just to say that they're not equivalent. Right, all they're of not them. teaching the same thing. And, but I would also say, even if they were, <laughs> right, even if they were, um, fundamentally, religions at their foundations are not about ethics. Right, there are foundational worldview claims or claims about. Uh, the way reality is, whether there's a God, what God is like, if there's a God, um, and then what are human beings, etc. So all of those kind of worldview questions are answered differently. But ethics is not that the foundations in a way, it's sort of on the surface level, so to speak. But people often right. are thinking that religions are all about ethics. And maybe because people have the idea that religion is about um, just providing you rules for life right. and teaching you ethical conduct. Um, but really, religions are making claims about ultimate reality, and then right. that has implications for how you live. Exactly. Right? But that's the working out of those claims. Right. No, that's a great point. And so in demonstrating this, that not all religions teach the same thing, and because their moral and ethical teachings are all interrelated to those how they answer questions about the fundamental aspects of reality, mm -hmm. then the ethical claims have different implications. And so what we want to, why this video is called The Elephant in the Room and Religious Differences is that when in interfaith dialogues, when you're going to have a conversation with people from different faiths, um, there is this looming understanding right. that at the core we believe different things. Mm -hmm. And both parties know that and understand that. And uh, the purpose of dialogue, especially interfaith dialogue, is to get to the truth. And in order to get to the truth, we have to address the fundamental differences. Right. So a great example 
using uh, the Quran and it, for, we'll use a different book than what's authoritative for us. Uh, right. There is a passage, uh, it's Surah 29, Ayah 46, Greg. Do you wanna, do you wanna yeah. read that? So this is from the clear Quran. Uh, do not argue with the people of the book. So that's Jews and Christians. So this is an instruction to Muslims. Don't argue with the people of the book unless gracefully, mm. except with those of them who act wrongfully. And say, so this is what the Muslims are supposed to say. Say, we believe in what has been revealed to us and what was revealed to you. Our God is your, and our God and your God is one. And to him we submit. So this is a wonderful passage to use to sort of break the ice in talking about the conversations and the fundamental differences. So the Quran is saying that our God, Christians, Jews, mm -hmm. and Allah is one. It's the same God. Mm -hmm. This is a great way to start a conversation. We can go down and say, okay, well, is that what we understand that the Bible teaches? And I think you had a great story about uh, an interaction with a yeah. with a Dawah leader. And even when we were dialoguing, why don't, why don't you share about those and how that was a great way to get into these conversations about the differences? Just a few days ago, I was at an interfaith dinner hosted by uh, a mosque. And there were lots of different religious leaders, representatives, and and political officials and stuff. And it was it was mainly just a dinner. But at the end of the dinner, one of the guys, basically their dawa leader, dawa is essentially means to call or invite to Islam, right? It's equivalent to what Christians would mean when we say the word evangelism, or when we're sharing the the message of the Bible. They're sharing the message of the Quran and inviting people to accept it. Right, so one of their leaders for that in their mosque kind of approached me at the end and toward I was about to leave and he said essentially, you know, he really appreciates me being there and I think he could tell from me and things I've said and my presence on other occasions that I'm there to have really substantial dialogue, not just sort of fluffy surface level. We all love each other, we care about each other, but we're not actually gonna talk about the elephant in the room, uh, which is that we actually disagree and we're, we'll actually talk about those things right. and try to make headway in pursuing truth. So he said, you know, I care about you as a brother and I would, but what I really want is for you to be a brother in the faith. Mm. And I told him, same. Right? Not that right. I would become a Muslim, but that he would become a Christian, just right. as he's saying he would want me to be a Muslim. That's right. And I actually really like that because um, by saying it up front, you're actually saying what's needed, like what the other person needs to know. And you're not hiding it. You're not right. being deceitful. And um, it actually is means you're willing to be say something that's socially uncomfortable right for the sake of the other person because i don't i don't presume that he had any negative motivations i think he he believes he has the truth right he believes i need to know it or otherwise i'm going to face god on judgment today and i'm not going to do well right right according to his beliefs same here so of course why would i withhold that from him and why would he withhold that from me right so that's, I find that a really great example. One other one at a mosque, I was at a different mosque, um, and I was talking about we, you know, sometimes I would organize these um, dialogue circles where we would regularly compare Bible, Quran, and mosques with Muslims, and we'd have Christians and Muslims gathered together looking at each other's scriptures, and so I was telling these this group of guys at this mosque, including their imam, and one of the guys was just so excited about it and he said uh wow why why do you want to do this and i said well look the reality is i believe in truth and i i value truth i think you do too and he said yeah i said well i believe we have the truth that you need to know and and if the bible is true as i believe it is then really you should all become christians and then I said, also the reverse, if, if the Quran That's is right, true yeah. and Islam is true, then I would want to know that and then I would become a Muslim, right? Right. The question really comes down to what is true 
and it's actually loving to invite people to follow after the truth because we're not if you know i think maybe people think that because religion isn't really about truth it's just your personal preference right um and you can't know the truth people have these wrong ideas or these assumptions that then they would Im impugn the motives of people whether christian muslim or otherwise who were trying to invite people to follow after the truth like a jehovah's witness that comes to my door even though people really don't like, you know, a lot of people really don't like Jehovah's Witnesses, I would love to have conversations with them right. because they believe what they believe is true and they're trying to offer that right. so that we have eternal life. So I really appreciate that. And the guy actually came up to me after we had that conversation. He's like kind of off to the side. He said, I really appreciated your directness. We don't hear that anymore. Yeah, it's true. In our Canadian culture. Right? Yeah, yeah, especially in Canada. Yeah. No, that's, that's great. And, and that's wonderful. And really what addressing the elephant in the room and why this is so vital, and this is something that I would love for, uh, for those of you that are interested in interfaith dialogues to take home is that addressing that elephant in the room early, what you're doing is you're creating a climate, you're creating yeah. an environment for the important dialogues. You're not gonna waste your time, like you said, talking about the fluffy stuff. Right. We're getting right to it and that understanding is on the table Mm -hmm. And you don't, the elephant in the room was addressed. That is what we want you to do. So moving forward, we mm -hmm. want to give a few examples of contradicting claims. And we can start more generally in terms of concept of God. And we'll move down to things that are more specific. And these are great things for you to use yourself mm -hmm. when people are making claims about religious teaching the same thing. Um, you can use these explanations to help mm -hmm. display and show right. that really they aren't. So let's start with uh, concept of God, pantheism, and monotheism. That was okay, something I just want to quickly address. say before we do examples is that you know we've been talking more about dialogue and in mosques and stuff. This right. is this is really, and you were getting to it. This is about also just one on one, your neighbors, your family members, your friends. Uh, you know, you don't have to be someone who uh, you know boldly goes into some other religious house of worship and right. has strikes of conversation. Right, it's like. Um, this is just everyday type of conversation. So I like to say front load your conversations and your friendships with people by talking about the substantial things and and trying to get at places of this is what I believe and what do you believe and get at those differences too. So yeah, That's examples. Um, you you were bringing up monotheism, monotheism and pantheism. Yeah, okay. So creature if we think of like if we think uh, there's so many examples we can give, but if we think kind of broad strokes about different even different kinds of religions. One of, the ma one of the major differences is about how we define the nature of the divine or the nature of God. So probably many people think of monotheism versus polytheism, one God versus many gods. Right. Well, there is that, okay? But also uh, monotheism versus pantheism. So a lot of people don't know pantheism. Theism meaning God and pan means all. So the, essentially it means all is God. Right. All is God. That's exactly where I came from. That's what I came out of right. as well. What I kind so of addressed at the beginning. New Age, spirituality, um, uh, Hinduism, at least certain forms of Hinduism, Advaita Vedanta, non-dualistic forms of it, um, arguably in Sikhism, um, although there might be differences there, um, etc. Like there's a lot of different religions have forms of pantheism everything is identified with god god is all um the essence of all things is god yeah pantheism versus monotheism monotheism also isn't just the claim that there is one god um that sometimes this may be misleading because of the way the word is formed but monotheism is saying not only that there is one but the nature of that god is that he's a personal god He's creator, meaning that he's creator and creature are not one thing, different they're things. different things. Right. So on, philosophically, we'd use the word on, ontology or ontologically they're distinct or substantially or what they are, are different things. Right. Um, so creator and cre creature, the creation, are not the same thing and they're not to be confused with one another. This is why when you think of, um, like traditional monotheistic religions like Islam, a rabbinic Judaism, Christianity, um, 
they all strongly shun idolatry. Uh, no other gods, no idols or images made representing God, no bowing down or serving them. Okay, so, um, and then in Islam is very, like, it's basically iconoclastic. It's very emphatically denies any form of images, mm -hmm. even of prophets. So, uh, not even just of God. That's right, yeah. The point is, uh, why, where does that come from? Is it's fundamentally rooted in this idea that creator and creation are not to be confused with one another. So if you make an image like the creature, as if that represents the creator, you have diminished the nature of the creator by relating it like on the same level as the creature. Right. Right. So idolatry in Islam, shirk, uh, associating partners with God or idolatry is the highest form of sin. Right. Um, so the point is pantheism, monotheism, these are completely making different claims because pantheism is saying the creation is the creator. Um, in fact, in one way, even the concept of creation is different because in Islam, Judaism, and Christianity, creation is, to use the Latin phrase in theology, we say creatio ex nihilo. So creation is ex nihilo, meaning out of nothing, meaning materially or what God used to create, he didn't use anything to create physically. There was nothing pre-existing. He spoke and it came into existence without anything pre-existing it. Whereas um, in pantheism, it's more creation ex deo or by emanation. So it's God actually emanating his own being into a different form. So that creation is God. There isn't any distinction fundamentally. Right. Pantheism, monotheism, concept of God is a great way to illustrate the differences between very different religions. Right. If you were to take Hinduism, for example, and Christianity. But now when we talk about closely related religions like Rabbinic Judaism, Islam, and Christianity, right. and I've had people say this to me personally multiple times, that don't you all believe in the same God? I mean, we read, we that, read verse that verse in yeah, the yeah. Quran, which yeah. says that our God is one, right? So how can we explain that difference to perhaps somebody who is they're most likely not a partaker of any of those religions mm -hmm. if they're going to make that claim? Um, who is Jesus? That's your that's your go to with that one. So why don't you break that down and how we can show the differences between what those religions teach? Yeah, you know, I, I am often have said the, the most important question we can answer in life really is who is Jesus? Right. Because it's the Jesus is the dividing line. The, one of the major dividing lines, ultimately, when you're comparing religions and right. the claims of them. Um, so if you just take those three religions, Rabbinic Judaism, which... Um, so, so this is the form of Judaism that rejects Jesus as the Messiah. Um, so that's essentially, yeah, Jesus is not the Messiah. Or the, There's some forms of Judaism that would say he is in a, maybe, the, maybe the Messiah for the Gentiles, but not for the Jews. Um, which I find a very bizarre claim because the, <laughs> the Bible has the Hebrew Old Testament doesn't have any concept like that. Um, but that's not all of them. But essentially, they're denying that he's the Messiah for Israel that's promised in the Hebrew Scriptures, the Old Testament. Um, and so he's, a, for the most part, he would be regarded as a false prophet by rabbinic Jews. Uh, whereas in Christianity, of course, Jesus is. The Messiah promised in the Old Testament, fulfilling those prophecies, and not only the Messiah and Savior for all the world, uh, but he is God who came in flesh. He is God who entered his creation as one of us. Um, so rabbinic Jews are denying that he is God incarnate, is denying he's the Messiah, denying he's the Savior for the world. And then there's Islam. Islam would teach he's just one among all of these different prophets. And he's no greater, really, than the other prophets. Um, and he's not God, definitely not God, according to Islam. Uh, the Quran emphasizes he's not God or the Son of God. And they say, but he, they do say he's the Masih, he is the Messiah. So he's the Messiah, he has that title, but he's not, and he is a prophet, but he's not God. So, I mean, this leads to obvious questions. Is he, is he God or is he not God? Right. Okay, so... That depends if you believe rabbinic Judaism, 
Islam or Christianity. They're saying different answers to that. Right. But even if you ended up on the side where you're saying he's not God, now what about rabbinic Judaism and Islam, which both say that he's not God? Well, rabbinic Judaism denies that he's the Messiah, whereas Islam says he is. Right. And he's that yeah, he's a true prophet, according to Islam, or he's not a true prophet, according to rabbinic Judaism. So how you answer who Jesus was, um, you can't answer that and believe in all three. Right. Or even two of them. That's right. Right. They cannot be teaching the same thing. Jesus is the pivotal point for mm -hmm. all of those. I actually think I remember seeing a clip of Ben Shapiro, who is mm -hmm. a religious Orthodox Jew. Yeah. Uh, his clip was saying that I believe that Jesus was a, uh, a Jewish uh revolutionary that tried to lead a revolt against the romans that was his like <laughs> quick synopsis of right. who jesus is so that gives a little example which, which is of, to say like, there are many other ways than those three answers that people give for who jesus right. is and these are not uh these are mostly mutually exclusive as well right uh do you want to touch quickly on uh so when we're talking about contradicting teaching uh, about what is your authority yeah, they're also different in what they're saying is scripture or is authoritative revelation or maybe there is no revelation. Some religions don't teach that there is any divine revelation. But if we're just looking at, again, well, those three even religions. Even the difference between divine inspiration in Christianity The difference and in definition of the concept of divine inspiration or divine authorship of scripture, right, um, is different. But biblical inspiration, the idea how God inspires the writers, the authors of, the human authors of the biblical books, um, is different than Islamic theology about divine inspiration, which is more of a dictation theory that God just spoke word for word, you repeat right. word for word. That's not how the Bible teaches. It's more that the Holy Spirit is working within the prophet or the apostle or the author of a biblical book so that they write the things that communicate the message of God, but it is both human and divine. Right. Right. Whereas in Islam, you can't have any human element or it's not divine. Um, that's their concept. So yeah, they're mutually exclusive definitions of divine inspiration, um, as well as which books are divinely inspired and authoritative. Right. And that difference on this point about source of authority the authority is the thing that determines what we ultimately are supposed to believe and how we're supposed to practice our religion right so in a way the authority is the most foundational thing right because it determines everything else right yeah that is and then talk about religious differences even if you want to get right. to within the christian realm sure when you talk about the protestant reformation and the divide that that came down to that was all about authority what's yes. the final authority yeah. And so that's even if you want to get into differences between denominations, doctrinal differences, such and such. And we could do that with other religions, Ahmadiyya and Sunni right. and all sorts of things. It's not yeah. just unique right. to Christianity that there's these divides within it mm -hmm. and different sources of authority and where they come from. Right. So now I'm trying to can think about how we can sort of land this at the, <laughs> at the end. I was thinking of finishing it off with, um, as we are Christians, mm -hmm. we believe the Bible to be true. And we see the uniqueness of Christianity. And we need to remember this is the motivation behind wanting to have the conversations about religious differences. Is that us, just like all of our Muslim neighbors, mm -hmm. all of our Hindu neighbors, uh, we have unique claims. We have differences that are not offered in any other religion that we right. want to share, that we want them to know about. Uh -huh. That really is, that needs to be the driving force in this, is that when you shared that really nice story about with the, the Dawa leader earlier, uh -huh. is that it's coming from a place of love, that we uh -huh. want to, we have something unique that you don't have, that we want you to know about, that we want to share with you, sharing the truth and love. Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets, but in these last days he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature, and he, uphol and he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, 
having become as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. So I guess you could ask, is that what other religions teach? <laughs> right. <laughs> so, right. Uh, I mean, exactly. the obvious thing is Jesus. no, right? Um, but again, and so if you're watching this and you're not a Christian, the, the point is that the claims in Christianity and the Bible are objective claims. There's, there's claims about reality. So it either is true or it's not. Right. Um, but if it is true, you can see the amazing nature of those claims and then the implications that would have for how we know God and how we can be reconciled to him. Right. And so this is not something that we can ignore. And this is why also, you know, I don't ignore what other religions teach. We need to learn about what each other religions teach. Obviously we can't learn everything, Right. but let's do our due diligence and try to learn and hear from one another, respect one another and search after the truth. So that's why we're here. That's right. So our exhortation to you today is to address the elephant in the room. Address right. it. It will improve your dialogues. Mm -hmm. And just like Greg said, front load your conversations with those around you and mm -hmm. work in your own sphere of influence, your coworkers, your family, the people around you. You'll find yourself talking about the gospel much more often than if we don't address those things, mm -hmm. right? Nice. Please share this video if you found this helpful and remember to like, subscribe, and hit the notification bell if you want to see more like it. Until next time, keep learning, keep loving, and keep sharing until all here. Yeah.